Hey, good morning. I know I'm a couple minutes early here. Uh, sounds like we might have to wait a little bit for the rescue truck to do a tour of that today because they're just getting geared up right now. You can probably hear our dispatchers talking over the radio. They're headed out to an accident at the moment. So hopefully we'll uh, get them back later on. And we'll be able to have a tour of Rescue One. So again, uh, if you've been watching some of the previous sessions, we are doing this live. And part of that, the technology, we do sometimes get some glitches that cut out. We'll come back, I promise. But, um, so we're up at station one in Sahali today, and we're hoping to take a look at rescue one when it gets back, if it's back on time. But also we're gonna check out engine one. We're just gonna go over exactly what a fire engine does, how it works. And if we've got time, we'll take a look around at some of the other things we've got here, like our, uh, our boat maybe. Okay, so we've got uh, platoon captain Ken Hart with us this morning. Hey everybody, how are you? He's gonna help us out looking through the engine. Uh, the rest of the crew is actually busy training downstairs at the moment. Uh, so this guy does not normally drive a fire truck anymore. He's the, the officer that sits over in the right hand seat He's the one making all the big decisions. So normally it's, it's gonna be someone else driving and uh, well, when's the last time you uh, drove a fire truck, Captain Hart? Uh, 2012. So he might be a little rusty, so I apologize if he's not the expert on the fire engine, but between the two of us, we should be able to, to uh, have a good look around here. Jamie and I right now are standing in the bay where our rescue truck is normally parked. So as you can see, we've got a big space here. They're out on a call right now. But we'll uh, send you over to the captain's side to start, since that's where my, my job is. Perfect. <clears throat> captain has a lot of responsibilities when it comes to, you can see my computer's actually flashing right now, which means there was a call for our engine, but uh, now it is not, uh, we're not dispatched that call, so I can clear that. And we're just in quarters. And this is my area. So you can see I have a computer. The things I use en route to my calls are my computer. I have passports right here for my names. My firefighters are on the shift with me right now. And uh, that's my board when I get to a call. I have a command board that's in here. So when I get to a fire call, this is, the, this is what I'm faced with, filling out my board making sure my personnel get put on properly. So you, you might have seen that board in action if you were watching with us yesterday at the, uh, the live fire evolution. You could see the captain carrying that same board around the building. And that's where he writes down quickly some of the, the plan of, of what he's gonna do. And it's also how he keeps track of where each firefighter on the fire scene is and what they're doing so that we know exactly how many people are there. And if something were to happen, then he can look at that and make sure that we've uh, kept track of everybody there. So the, the captain has certain responsibilities when we go to a call. I'm, show, I'm following the map so I can zoom in and zoom out where the truck is. Right now, if I wanna know where the truck is, the truck is parked at fire station number one. So then I can just leave it here and we're, we're not fire station one. I have to talk on my radio. So when, I, when I'm talking to dispatch or my other trucks, I use my radio. So you, you'll probably hear a bit of that in the background coming from our rescue truck and our engine that are uh, actually out of call at the moment. Speaking right. of which, there they are. Um, important things for the captain to do en route to the fire. Always wearing my headset so I can hear what's going on. So that'll be on my head, like so. Now that, that headset has two jobs. One so that you can talk to the others, but what's, what's the other? Correct. So I can talk to my crew 
in my headset and I can push this red button to talk to dispatch. That also helps all the all the crew, the, the driver, the captain and the crew in the back are all wearing those headsets so they can talk to one another. But the other thing that's, uh, that those headsets are doing is of course, what's a fire truck responding to an emergency doing? Making all kinds of noise. And over a full career of listening to that siren, it can actually damage our hearing. So that's why we wear those headsets to uh, so we can speak to each other, but it also blocks out the sound to protect our hearing. Exactly, and I don't think uh, most of us that have been here for a while, our hearing has changed, uh, hasn't changed lots, and we do hearing tests today. So the, the captain's just getting called right now to uh, go and talk to dispatch. So I'm just gonna wander around a bit more of the truck here while he's doing that. It's a busy fire hall here at station number one. This is kind of the nerve center. This is where our administration is. This is where the fire chief works. This is where the fire prevention office is. So there, there's always something happening here. At, uh, we sometimes call it station one more thing. So I'm gonna just wander through the back of the truck here. One of the other pieces of equipment that we carry back here that you might have seen yesterday at Live Fire. This, this is pretty cool. This thing is pretty neat. So I'm gonna turn this on and this is a special type of camera. It's called a thermal imager. It's gonna take a minute to warm up. So now what you're seeing on this camera is actually heat. So this camera works in the pitch black, in thick smoke. It still sees all the sorts of things that you're seeing on the screen right now, even if it's completely dark. So this is something that we can use to help find where the fire is. You can see on the side here, it's got a, a gauge. It shows us the temperature of things. And we can also use it to look for any people that might be in the smoke that we can't see with our own eyes but this camera will still be able to see them and it's quite sensitive uh inspector webster can you just put your hand on the wall for a second beside you so you see that it, it's actually picking up the heat that was left by his hand on the wall so i'm going to turn that off Back in its charger. So the other thing that we need is uh, we need lights to be able to see in a fire. So we've got lots of those. And Firefighter Ball is here to help us. Good morning. So like I was saying, it's a busy place right now, but here, let me jump out for a second here. Now, can I put you on the spot for a second? Yep. I'm just gonna get uh, Firefighter Ball to introduce herself. Hi, uh, my name is Firefighter Ball. I've been with Kamloops Fire and Rescue over 20 years and uh, was the first girl hired at the fire department here. What fire hall do you normally work at? I work at Aberdeen, which is station number seven. What's your favorite thing about being here? About being a firefighter? Yeah. Uh, working with the people in the community and helping people in their times of trouble. Yeah, well, thanks for helping us out right now with our, our truck tour. Okay. So we've just gone through, well, we haven't done anything that the driver has. Can you jump up there oh, for us? Oh, that the driver and... has? Sure. Okay, so uh, what would you like to know, eh? <laughs> well, what's, what's the difference between this and just any other big truck? Well, number one would have to be the size and weight of the vehicle. Um, so you have to drive accordingly. Um, you have to be slower um, because you have longer braking distances. And um, yeah, you're driving code three, so lights and sirens sometimes. So you have to be aware of your surroundings. So if we're going to a fire, the you know obviously the first job of the truck is to get us there. Correct. But then when we get to a fire, it kind of converts into a, a, an engine, a pumper. So yes. how does that work? Uh, how it works is we carry water on our truck in a tank and that's what we can use if we are going just to a small fire and we don't need extra water. At a structure fire we have to connect up to a hydrant 
and that means um, we connect a hose from the hydrant and put all the water into the truck so we can have unlimited supply of water at the fire. So what kind of things can you control from up here? Um, okay, so what I can control is um, we have our lights and sirens right up here. These are This is the siren and our lights are... Right we're, gonna, we're gonna turn those on later, right? Sure, yeah. This is uh, this panel is all of our lights for the engine. And then our siren is right here. And then we have pretty well typical gauges that you have on most vehicles um, on the dash of your vehicle. There's a few more. Um, we also have head protection. Yeah, Captain Hart was uh, demonstrating those for oh, us a okay. couple minutes ago. Okay, he's got that taken care of. What's that, uh, that little red switch down there? Oh, this switch? This is what we switch uh, to put our truck into pump gear. So the engine on the truck, the, the actual motor, is obviously what makes it drive to the fire. But then when we get to a fire, we stop the truck and we, we throw some switches and it takes the power from the engine and takes that away from the wheels. So then the fire truck can't move anymore once we're at a fire and it sends it to the fire pump. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. Okay, so can we uh, have a look at some of what the, the fire truck carries? Absolutely. So you, if you were watching on Monday, you might've seen me mention that a fire truck really is, it's like a giant rolling toolbox. It's got all kinds of equipment for all sorts of different things all around it. So we're gonna just go through some of the cabinets and talk about what we carry. Okay, so um, this is in our first cabinet here. This side is um, mostly for forcible entry. So we have tools in case we have to open up uh, windows and doors to access um, into a home or into a car fire, we have to open up compartments. So that's what we use these for. Um, we also have our fire extinguishers. So we have a dry chemical extinguisher. Okay, hopefully some of you are still with us. Sorry, these are the joys of uh, live technology, but uh, something happened, we lost our stream there. So we're back and we're gonna carry on with uh, the fire truck here. My tech guy is just making sure everything's working. Hopefully we still have some of you with us. Okay, so we were just talking about the fire extinguishers. And of course, you know, this is a bigger version of what hopefully Everyone has a few of at home, and uh, we can talk a lot more about extinguishers later on, but uh, hopefully everyone has one at their home near an exit and that they know how to use it. So there's lots of information around extinguishers that we can talk about later. Okay, on with the tour. Okay. Oh, what's this big orange thing? This big orange thing is called a Rit Pack. And what it actually is, is a, it's just a big bottle of air that we take in to, uh, you can see the bottle right there. If we have a firefighter um, go down on a call and he needs to be rescued, this is what we bring in to supply him with um, more air. So we were talking yesterday about how important our air packs are when we're at a fire. And all of this equipment is if we have a malfunction or something goes wrong with our air packs, then this has all the different tools that we need to fix the problem inside the building. So remember we were talking about a RIT team, Rapid Intervention Team. They take this equipment in with them to rescue the downed firefighter. And if they need anything out of here, then they can get air to them again because that is the most important thing that we need inside a building on fire. Besides water, put the fire out, of course. Okay, I'll leave that. I'll come back to that. Okay, so in this drawer, we have our air bottles. So we always carry extra bottles on the truck because when we're working in a fire, uh, we obviously need to replace our bottles once the air 
get slow. So that, that's a lot of air bottles. That must be good for like a couple fires, right? Uh, absolutely not. Um, the typical bottle um, lasts around 30 minutes if you're lucky. Um, so, and if you're working hard, it lasts a lot less than that. So we always have to carry extra bottles and we exchange them as we use them. Yeah, if we're at a big fire, you'll see piles of these stacked up and we, we sometimes actually have to have uh, somebody come and run the, the bottles back to the fire hall so we can fill them up again, take them back out to the fire. That's, that's how much air we use when everybody's working hard. Okay, so then we use the shovels primarily at uh, grass fires and then we have a couple of these hooks that's kind of a weird looking tool you know a lot of people have probably never seen that one before the this silver one. Oh, this one it's called a halligan and basically what it is it's a pry bar so it's got all kinds of different points on it and that's kind of one of the best ways of getting doors open but you don't want us to come and open up a door for you if it's not an emergency because uh, if we open a door with with that thing the door tends to not close very well afterwards <laughs> okay we're ready for the next one yeah. Oh, this stuff looks fun. Yeah, this is a fun compartment. Um, most people will probably recognize some of the things on this shelf here. What do, what do we use chainsaws for? Uh, sometimes at uh, fires we have to cut holes for the hot gases and smoke to escape. And so that's primarily what we'd use a saw for there. And then we have special kind of saws. That can cut through different material. Like this, it's called the case saw. So that thing's pretty big. You, you gotta be strong to work that thing. Yes, you do. And you are. <laughs> so actually, we had a question early on that uh, I just wanna answer. Um, somebody had asked, do we inventory the truck at the start of every shift? And the answer is yes, absolutely. It's the, the operator, the driver's job, to go through the entire truck at the start of the shift and make sure not only that all the equipment is there, but that everything's working, that all those saws are fueled up and they're, they're, they start and all those things and go through everything, make sure the air bottles are full. So what do we have here? That looks like the world's biggest can opener set. Well, that, that actually is what it is. It, these, um, these two pieces of equipment we use uh, during auto extrication. And some of you may have heard of the jaws of life. And that's what these are. And basically we use these to open up uh, cars when they're in accidents. So if your door is jammed shut and you have, we have to get you out, this is what we use. We use a combination of the jaws of life and they act as a spreading tool. We can put them in a point in your car and spread the metal away. And then we access things like hinges, which we need to cut. And then we have this and there are cutters. So what are those, those hoses back there that you took off first? What are those for? Oh, okay. Uh, these tools are hydraulic tools. So basically they just are, they hook up to your pump and that's how they're powered by hydraulics so basically this just hooks from the pump to the tool as we turn our handles open and shut so you can see it rotates now these tools also lift things not just spread things we can lift something up to twenty thousand pounds with these with these spreaders i believe is our max out but we don't want to lift we have airbags for that kind of stuff and our rescue truck will be back hopefully but they also have a bigger set of these tools and you'll get to see those. But yeah, so we use spreaders and cutters. So, so those tools are actually incredibly powerful. Um, hard to believe, but Captain Hart was saying they can lift things. I mean, these, these spreaders 
like he said, it's not the ideal tool, but they're actually strong enough that we could use it to, as a jack to start lift up part of the fire truck right off the ground. True, sir. So that's pretty strong. And you can see this is kind of set up to be our extrication. Um, this is our extrication drawer. So you also have this funky looking piece of thing, which is a seatbelt cutter. So the seatbelt slides through there and you pull and it will cut the seatbelt for you. So this stuff is the, the basic equipment for auto extrication. Uh, when our fire engines can get on scene quickly at an accident, they've got the, the basics of what they need to hopefully get the person out of the vehicle. We have a truck that carries a lot more of that kind of stuff, and that's where they normally park, and hopefully they'll be back in here in a couple minutes. They are, they're coming right now. So as you can see, this is our, oh, here they come. There we go. So we're gonna get out of the way so we don't get run over as they uh, back in here. Okay, so we'll get back to that truck in a couple minutes. Hopefully they won't have to leave again. It's a pretty busy truck though, so they're, they're in and out of here a lot. Okay, this is the four inch diameter hose. And what we do is this is the hose that we actually connect to our hydrants. It carries a large volume of water from the hydrants into the truck. So we can use it uh, to put the fire out. So that sound you're hearing is a truck uh, getting called out. West side. Okay, so we carry uh, some different kinds of hose up here too. Okay, so this hose here is called the two and a half inch hose. And basically what this does is this will take to actually put the fire out. We'll run this hose to where the fire is and we'll put water on the fire with this hose. The bigger the hose diameter usually is an outside line uh, that will be used to maybe protect the house next door so that that doesn't burn if your house is burning or a house is burning that your house doesn't catch fire we also have lots of that supply line so lots of extra line if we have to add to that attack line or if we want to make sure our hydrant is dressed properly or it has two attachments to it uh, two on each side of the smaller fort so the two and a half fort and ahead you'll see a giant fort which is our four inch fort so when we put stuff on hydrants now, we leave room to attach two lines. So if we need extra water, we can get extra water from the fire hydrant. So there's one big difference. It's the same type of hose that you see there Correct. and over there. But, but one big difference on this truck is that this one is what's called a pre-connect. So that means it's already connected to the pump and we get to a fire, all the firefighter has to do is grab that, pull it out, and the pump operator can charge it. We've got water right away. This one, so this has a thing on the end that allows us to split it up for smaller lines. But once we've got that where we want it, then the other end of the hose has to get connected to one of these before we can use it. So where's the part that actually pumps the water on this truck? Okay, the part that pumps the water So it's kind of dark, you won't be able to see much, but inside here, that's all the machinery that actually pumps the water. So like Firefighter Ball was saying, we use the big yellow hose to bring water from the fire hydrant to the fire truck, then it goes into the pump, and we got a flashlight here, and the power from the engine is what turns that part in there. And then the pump operator can control where that water goes and what pressure it's at. So we'll show you the, the pump panel next, which is like the controller part. So they can pick which fire hoses that we want to use. Okay, so this is our pump panel and it has uh, lots of different components to it. This looks like we're playing video games or something here. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty important stuff. 
to be able to know what to do with your pump panel when you're at a fire. Because you have to make sure that the guys always have water. What do the different colors mean? Uh, which different colors? Like the blue, the red, the yellow. Oh, okay. Well, the red here, you can see coincides with there's the tank fill, deck gun. Some of the, some of the lines supply foam in the lines and some don't. So all of these ones, they don't supply foam. And all the ones, oh. Yeah, so, so those are regular water. The red ones? Yeah. And then the yellow on the bottom, all supply foam. What's, what is foam? Foam. Um, foam is just an additive. It's kind of like dish soap that you add to your water during a fire. And it just allows the water to seep into the materials better and extinguish the fire. What about these blue ones here? All of those are intakes. Okay. What about this colorful one? This colorful one, it just basically shows you how much water you have left. So our tank's full right now. And our foam tank is full. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this truck actually carries water inside the truck as well as the water that's coming from the fire hydrant. 500 gallons. 500 gallons of water on each of our frontline engines at most. Some have a little bit more, but most of our frontline engines for, for um, our main fire halls have 500 gallons. So if 500 gallons, that's about 1,900 liters for any Canadians that might be watching. <laughs> <laughs> no, most of our equipment comes from the United States, so we generally work with gallons and pounds per square inch and all those kinds of things. As you can see, all the gauges have PSI on them or pounds per square inch, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not in the metric system, it's in Imperial. Okay. All kinds of different nozzles, connections, whatever we might need. Yeah. And we, we saw some of this stuff that's underneath in action yesterday. Our hydrant bag. Did you go over that yesterday? Well, just in a hurry. So remember that we said we have the port, extra ports on the side of our fire hydrant. Now we have not only to hook up these two, so that's on each side of the hydrant in this direction like this. And then this big four inch guy comes off the main port. So if you hold that there like that, and this like this, that's what your fire hydrant's gonna be dressed like when we go to a fire. So we sometimes, you know, get people who ha don't understand what we're doing that uh, when we show up at a house fire and then all of a sudden we stop the truck, you know, half a block away and a firefighter jumps out and we'll have people, you know, waving at the house going, no, this, this is the house on fire. But that's because we have to stop at the fire hydrant, have the one firefighter jump out and do all these connections before the truck drives to the fire. We're hoping that our 500 gallons on our truck is enough to put out the fire in your house or a house next to you. So we don't have to use our water from it, but we need to have that just in case we do need more water. So we're always stopping at a fire hydrant. And that brings up the point of, we always have to be able to find your fire hydrant. So sometimes uh, people don't clear the snow from around their fire hydrant. And so when we drive up to a scene and we're looking for a hydrant, we don't see it if it's covered with snow or covered by bushes or branches or big tall grasses. So it's really important for us to get to connected to that hydrant as quick as possible and to get to the fire as quick as possible. So we need you all to take care of your fire hydrants for us. Hey, a fire truck with more hose. What's this one for? So this is called an apartment pack and it's basically for apartment fires and it's just an easy way to get a whole bunch of hose up floors of a building um, so we can attach it uh, a floor below the fire and get water to the, the apartment that's on fire. So if you were watching on Monday when we did the fire hall tour up at station seven, uh, there was a little bit there about the standpipe that we used to practice and that's the same type of pipe that's in high-rise buildings. So that's the hose that we take in to, to connect to one of those. That's correct. And in an emergency, if we need a more, more pre-connected hose, this is a simple hookup to one of those ports that we showed you at the back too. We can just pull this off, lay it on the ground and hook it up to our back of our truck and use it for a, a water supply outside as well. So it's, it's multi-purpose. And since we have a straight stream as well as a a uh, fog stream on here, we can get more reach with our water.
Okay, and the last one. Okay, so this, this looks familiar to a lot of people. Uh, basically, it's called a positive pressure ventilator, but it's actually a big fan. And it's a big fan um, so we can control where we move smoke in a fire. And so if we can get smoke out of the building in a fire, we get greater visibility. And that's what we want so we can A, see where the fire is and also we need to be able to see if the people are in the building, we need to see where they are so we can get them out. So that's, that's that. Um, this is just a regular toolbox. So it has all of our tools in there, pliers, screwdrivers, wrenches. Your dad probably has something like that at home in his shop. What about ladders? Every fire truck's supposed to have ladders, aren't they? I don't see any on this one. Uh, we do, they're actually hidden on this one. You have to come all the way to the back where remember we open up this to see where our pump is. Uh, I didn't see any ladders in there. No, no ladders in there. But well, right there here. There's one. No, not that one. Ah, okay. Like that. There's ladders. Different types of ladders. 35 foot ladder, and a roof ladder, and these crazy pipe poles. I don't know if you saw those yesterday or not. No, we didn't no. see those. So, if I pull out a pipe pole. There's a pipe pole. That's basically the, when we go into a structure, we can't reach a ceiling and the fire is up above us, we want to make sure it's out. We're going to reach this tool in here where its hook is and start pulling the ceiling down. It's like a giant, uh, giant pole and we just push it in the ceiling and pull the ceiling down and then we can see the fire. Or if we have to go through a wall, sometimes they get used to break down through walls too so we can see if there's a fire there. That sounds like a really easy job. It's a very tiring job. Yeah. Very... <laughs> That's where most of your air gets used is when you're pulling ceilings down. Not so much attacking the fire, but definitely after. And there's a special ladder in here too called a attic ladder and it's a folding ladder. So that folds up to eight and a half feet high. And then we can reach up into an attic space and crawl in there. Make sure if you want to have a look in there, you pop the attic hatch and have a look around. Also looking for fire. Okay, so we're going to take a look up in the cab at the back, just a little bit more of the equipment in there, uh, and then we're going to wrap up our tour of the fire engine here. So if anybody has any questions about the fire engine, then uh, type them in now and we'll try and answer them before we move on to the rescue truck. Okay, so have you looked at anything in the back? Just the thermal imaging camera. Thermal imaging camera. Okay, so what we have back here, basically all of this stuff here, this is all our personal protection like for COVID. And so we, we wear masks, we wear gloves, we wear a gown that covers our whole body. Um, so we take all the precautions so we don't transmit COVID to each other. Just like everyone at home is doing, I hope. And then we have a couple of big first aid kits. Both of these are first aid kits. So we have to take two first aid kits plus this bottle. This bottle here, it's not like the other bottles on the truck. It doesn't actually carry air in it. What it carries is oxygen. So we supply oxygen to lots of patients that are sick and it helps them get better. So that's our oxygen bottle. Our first aid kit has a lot of different things in it as well. From masks to um, stuff like glucogel that helps people that are diabetics. One of the most important things we carry in here is this big black box here. And this big ba black box is called the AED, which is a um, defibrillator basically. What it does is uh, there are certain rhythms in people's hearts that we can actually uh, shock to make their heart 
get back to normal rhythm and work properly for them. So it's important to get these on somebody as soon as possible when they have a heart attack. So that's why uh, you have to have early recognition and not uh, deny the signs if you have chest pain. You have to call the ambulance and get them to you as quick as possible if you want a good outcome. Now, as important as that piece of equipment is, that's one of the, the uh, pieces of technology that have made a huge difference in people recovering from heart attacks. But what still makes the biggest difference, if someone has a heart attack, cardiac arrest, and they call 911, it's going to take us four to five minutes at best to get on scene, get out of the fire hall and get to the call, depending on how far we have to drive. Now, we want people to have oxygen circulated through their bodies in less than four minutes. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's where it's super important for everyone who can to learn the basics of CPR because the work that you do, if someone you love in your family was to have a heart attack, you knowing CPR is what's going to make the biggest difference to how well they recover. Even more important than anything that we're carrying. Absolutely. Oh, what about this? Uh, is that one of those pool noodles? <laughs> This kind of does look like a pool noodle and it's actually a rescue sling to um, get somebody out of the water and especially for ice rescue or water rescue if we need to, um, oh, I'll just take it out, get them out of the water. So basically what we do is we just put it around their bodies and then we tape it shut. Now you float. And now we float and we can help these people get out of the water. We've, we've got a little bit of uh, water rescue equipment in here as well. Yeah, we have life jackets. A little bit for, a little bit of something for everything. Throw bags in case we can throw the rope to help someone out. What's, what's this blue kit here? This blue kit. You don't have to open it right up, but that's uh, something. Well, can you have, take, a, take a guess? Look at the outside of it pet oxygen mask so thankfully thanks to smoke alarms it's fairly infrequent that we have to rescue people out of their houses nowadays most people have a working smoke alarm that they've been checking and testing and they know what it sounds like by the time we get to a house on fire everybody's safely out unfortunately sometimes pets don't know what to do so that's where we actually do a lot of pet rescues and uh, we we've, can give them some oxygen to help the pet get better. So we will go in and get them. So the, other, the only other thing we carry in here is the, that we showed yesterday a little bit in the seats, built into the seats, are our air packs. And you saw everyone wearing those yesterday at the fire, but that's, they sit right in the seat and on the way to the fire, the firefighter can jump in, throw their seatbelt on, and still be able to put that pack on and it's secure in the seat and then there's a handle down there a yellow handle that they pull that and it releases okay so that wraps up our our fire engine tour thank you very much firefighter ball for helping us out oh you're more than welcome and we're actually gonna have to take a quick break here because i gotta change batteries on my camera so please uh watch our page for a second and we'll get going on the rescue truck. See you in a minute. Okay, we're back. So, uh, rescue one. This is the only truck that we have in Kamloops that is a rescue truck. This truck goes all over the place in the city to all the accidents. And it also goes outside the city on the highways to a certain distance outside of town for highway rescues. So we spend a lot of time on the Coquihalla, up Highway 5, you know, the places where all the, the big highway accidents are. Now I mentioned the fire truck was like a rolling toolbox. Well, this thing is even bigger toolbox, carries all sorts of equipment for the different types of rescues that we might have to do. One of its biggest jobs, as we said already, is going to, to vehicle accidents. So it's got all the equipment for that, but it also has equipment for water rescues, for ice rescues, rope rescues, and the other big job for the, the rescue truck that you might have seen yesterday when we were at the live fire training center, when we get a fire, the crew that's on the rescue truck, their main job when they show up at the fire is to set up the RIT, the rapid intervention team. So they're the crew that's going to be responsible for rescuing other firefighters if they were to get into trouble. 
So we're gonna take a walk around the truck here and look at some of the equipment that's specific to this one. So the, the driver's area, you can just like poke the camera right in there, is similar to a fire engine. It's got the it's sort of computer looking thing here that, that controls the generators and all the things that we use to make power for the hydraulic tools. We've got room in the back here for a couple of extra firefighters to ride back here, but we've also got it fairly stuffed full of equipment. So there's more COVID equipment, medical equipment. We carry in this uh, cabinet here, we're not gonna open it up, but we carry extra medical equipment for large scale motor vehicle accidents. There's lots of people that we need to help. So this first section here, this is most of the, the rope rescue equipment. Yeah. Okay, so we got the rope rescue equipment that we use in places like Peterson Creek and Ord Road, um, wherever someone might need uh, extra equipment here. The other place where we use this a lot is at highway accidents on places like the Coquihalla where a car has gone down over the bank and we have to use our basket stretcher and a rope system to bring them back up from down where the accident, where the car ended up and bring them up so that the BC ambulance paramedics can, can help them up at the road. So you can see when it comes to rope rescue, this is just some of what we carry. We have a separate truck just for rope equipment but it takes a lot of gear and a lot of people to do a rope rescue. Anyway, so more equipment here. This is all part of our stuff that we use. One of the problems with a vehicle that goes over the bank or flips, you know, they're upside down, they're unstable. We don't want that vehicle to fall on top of the rescuers. So we have to put all kinds of equipment around. Sometimes it's just a car or pickup truck. Sometimes it's a big, semi tractor trailer unit so we have to stabilize everything so that we can safely open it up and get the person that's stuck in there out of the vehicle and that's just what some more of this equipment is we, we can look at that on the other side whatever kind of cutting tool that you might need back here this is where we carry our, our stretchers so we use these in rope rescues or car accidents or anywhere where we need to put somebody up in a in a stretcher and carry them safely out here we carry this is more mostly where that I was talking about the RIT equipment this is where that's kept so we carry our own fire hose that connects up to a fire engine so if the RIT team has to go in they have their own water supply hey now You might have seen on the fire engine, the uh, hydraulic tools. The rescue truck carries another set here. It's on these long reels. So the hose just gets quickly clamped up, get over to the vehicle and open them up. These are for also, also for stabilizing a vehicle. So we've got the spreaders and the cutters on this side. And then over on the other side of the truck, we have another set. So same thing, another set of spreaders, and we have these hydraulic rams. So these extend out and they can push things apart and open things up. Say somebody's feet are trapped under the dashboard, we could use these to try and push the dashboard up away from them and get them out of the vehicle. And then we've also got the portable power here. So if the accident is too far away from the truck, like at the, you know, over the bank on the Coquihalla, then we can use this just like you saw on the fire engine with some other hoses to, to hook it up. Now the rescue truck does not carry water like a fire truck does. It looks the same as a fire truck, but it's not a fire truck. What we do carry are these special extinguishers here that have a foam mixture in them 
that we can spray onto spilled fuel. So hopefully if there's gas or diesel, that that won't catch fire. So we use these to protect the person in the vehicle and ourselves. And then more, more special cutting tools. So this is a special blade that can cut through all kinds of different materials. It might be used at a fire to open up a building. It might be used to cut steel if we need to rescue someone or concrete, whatever it is. Uh, one thing, if you see the rescue truck at an accident in town, you're probably gonna see this stuff looks like kitty litter. That's pretty much what it is, but it's a special absorbent clay that we put down on any fluids that have leaked onto the ground to, to try and absorb them. These are a special kind of airbag. They're not very thick, but what we do is we slide them under a vehicle and we hook an air hose up to this and then inflate it. And as it lifts up, it can lift the vehicle and push it up. And then we can put this cribbing in place to uh, protect the, the vehicle so it doesn't roll over. But this is how we can lift things off. These are incredibly strong. You can lift a lot of weight with these. So these really long tubes here, those are, uh, you saw the base plate that we put on the bottom. These are some more of the equipment that we use at accidents to stabilize a vehicle. We make like a, a triangle around it and we can connect these together to make them even longer so that for big trucks and things like that, that we can keep them stable. And all sorts of tools for prying, for breaking, smashing, whatever we need to do, generally for opening things up, forcing entry into buildings or vehicles. Yeah, you can see we carry lots of this wood, the cribbing. And we have a winch here that we don't really use that for dragging things up like you might use a winch on a pickup truck. We might use that to stabilize something so that say if it's on a slope and a vehicle's on a slope and you don't want it to roll further down until you've set up the rest of the stabilization system. So that's some of the uses for that, but we don't use it to, to pull things up the hill usually. That's just about it for what's down here. Um, I'm gonna climb up on top of the truck and just show you a little bit more of what's up there. We can't get all the cabinets open because this truck is so high and inside the truck bay here, there's actually some of the exhaust system in the way. Those pipes that you see up there, that's actually part of the system so that as the trucks go in and out of the hull, that we don't fill the fire hole up with exhaust. Okay, uh, Firefighter Silva's been shy, but maybe he can open the bins for us. Okay, so just more storage space up here. This is some of the stuff that we don't necessarily use all the time. In here, this is actually a special type of inflatable rescue boat. We mostly use it in the winter time on the ice. We could use it any time of the year, um, but that's what it's specifically designed for. These are the, the paddles for it. We have our ice rescue ropes. We already saw a couple of these on the engine. These are the suits that we have to wear to go on ice. And then down here, we've got this special, it's called a, uh, a Rapivac. Well, this is the Rapivac and a Sked. So those are special stretchers that we use in places where maybe on a steep slope, you know, someone's on Peterson Creek, or if they're in a really tight spot where we can't fit one of the, uh, the regular stretchers. And then the final thing over here is this big wheel. And what we do with that is we attach that to the bottom of the big stretcher that you saw down on the side of the truck. And if someone's way up in Peterson Creek or wherever else and they've fallen, broken their leg, we can use that to help roll them out and carry them, which is, makes a better ride for them and it's better for us. And the other thing that's up here is this, uh, it's all folded up right now, but this is kind of like our portable stadium lighting. 
So when we get to a car accident or anywhere at night, it could be used as a fire scene. That'll fold up, it goes way up in the air, and then we can use that to light up the area so that we can do our work better in the, in the light. And the other bins over here, we can't open up because of this exhaust in the way. So that's about it for the rescue truck. So hopefully uh, you learned a few things. And uh, tomorrow we'll be using the rescue truck, hopefully this one, back at the training center. We'll be live there at 10 o'clock doing auto extrication. So hopefully you can join us for that. And that'll be a lot more fun to see some of this equipment in action. And the other piece of equipment that's here at station one at the moment is our jet boat which shortly this will be headed down to park place uh, be sitting on the river ready to go that's a lot faster for us to be able to respond when the boat is already docked and in the water now this particular boat is a jet drive engine you might hear it sometimes out on the river so it, it uses a jet instead of a propeller and the reason for that is that a lot of times we get people in trouble with their boats on the sandbars, especially down past the airport. And they, they get stuck in some really shallow spots in the river. Um, so that's why we ended up getting a jet boat so that we can hopefully get to where they're, they're stuck at. What we're going to do now is just wander over in and visit dispatch. So I have to be a little bit quiet in there. There might be a call going on. Are we busy in here? We are not. Hey. So this is the room where all the uh, computers and the dispatchers are. That when, like I mentioned, if someone calls 911 and they're asked police, fire, or ambulance, and that's the RCMP dispatcher that's talking. And if someone says fire, then the call gets transferred into this room. This is one of our dispatchers here. Hi, <laughs> I'm Jenna. So how big of an area are you looking after in here? Uh, well, we service all of Kamloops and the surrounding area and then the whole TNRD. And just for fire? Uh, well, we take public service calls, fire calls. Um, sometimes we'll get medical calls that come through straight to us and we'll downstream them to ambulance. Um, RCMP calls sometimes come to us, so we will kind of facilitate that um, as well as forestry calls. So what are some of the fire departments that you dispatch? It's because it's not just Kamloops Fire Rescue, it's a whole bunch of departments. Yes, so we do Castlegar, which that's our map right there. So that's the area of Castlegar that we service. And then this map here is our TNRD map. So all of the different communities like this is Merritt. Logan Lake, Ashcroft, Cash Creek, all the colored areas are the areas that we take calls for. Um, the solid... That's... Sorry. The phone's ringing, so dispatch has to answer. That's not the 911 okay. phone, though, so okay. not quite an emergency. Um, you know what? That's a good question. They have been out for a bit, so I believe they were coming up to one... <laughs> okay. So when they're, when they're not answering 911 calls, they kind of act like a secretary in here sometimes. <laughs> So yeah, so all of these areas, the solid areas, these are the boundaries for the different communities. So anytime that there's a call within this block, um, that would be everything. Fires, fire alarm calls, uh, medicals, MVIs, basically anything that we would respond to, we would dispatch for in here. All of the colored lines, that's all of the different highways. So if we say got a call right here, from BC Ambulance and they said that there was a rollover, then we would page out the community that um, matches the color. Sometimes it's a dual response. So if you look like right here, this would be Kamloops and Logan Lake that would go to that. So sometimes depending on where it is or here, it would be Logan Lake and Merritt. So it just really depends on the actual location. Um, obviously anything that isn't an MVI for us, we wouldn't go to in that area, but basically anything that is a motor vehicle incident with possible entrapment that's where we would go so it is a pretty big area we go all the way up to um Bavenby. you can see a vola there's some rural rescue up there for blackpool and all the way up to uh north well south green lake uh the south side of south green lake uh, see it's it's non-stop in here Catlin's fire rescue
So we're, we're going to leave Jenna alone because now she's got another phone call. So okay. uh, you can see that? normally oh, there's there's more than one dispatcher in here, but she's handling everything on her own. So we're going to get out of the way. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah,